Good morning, church. I really should say, like, hello, earthlings. Welcome to space or something like that, but I'm not that cool. All right. Feel free to stand with us as we begin our time of worship. Our God, our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, the nations rise and fall, kingdoms once strong now shaken, we trust forever in your name name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are, you are the only key forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only key forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched, unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only key forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only key forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high, we lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only key forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only key forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good to be here with you. Good to worship with you. We have a few announcements this morning, but first, if you're uh, with us visiting, welcome. We're glad you're here. We are not a cult. This is BBS back here. <laughs> 
We were so excited this week. Uh, Samantha's been prepping um, for weeks now, and she's going to give us an announcement on BBS. So here, here she is. Good morning. Uh, VBS is this week, so backdrop's not finished yet, but it's almost finished. Uh, today, after church, I'm asking that everybody turns in their volunteer applications today, and if you lost yours, I'll have extra for you to fill out. And uh, I'll be in room A, so if you're a crew leader, you can bring your baskets or bags, your signs, and your jackets or cardigans. And if you're a station leader, I'll collect your jackets and blanket and just have all your name on your stuff if you want to get it back. And then after church today, we'll be finished setting up VBS. So anyone, whether or not you're involved in VBS, can stay and help if you'd like. It's a lot of moving chairs and tables. So we would love some men to stay and help. And that is it. So thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for all your hard work. And thank you, all the volunteers that have been coming during the week. I stopped by this last week and... Uh, it's been nonstop for Samantha and Seth and the family and lots of hands that have helped. And we still need you, uh, especially today. So if you are willing to go grab a lunch and come back and meet Samantha here to help with uh, moving things, she would much appreciate it. A couple other things. Normally, the crochet class is on Tuesday, correct? But it's getting moved to Monday. So ladies, if you've been coming to that crochet class, it'll be on Monday because of BBS. And it'll, they'll meet in the nursery. So just take a note of that. Um, text Mackenzie with uh, any questions that you may have. Um, otherwise, um, car wash. You guys did great. I just got uh, some info on it. They made $880. And yeah. What a blessing. And camp is paid for. So they are just, they're blessed and they're eager to attend camp. And what, a, what an awesome week that's going to be uh, for them. Um, start praying for them. Start praying for who is going to camp and that the, the Lord would change their lives and that they would, he would get a hold of them um, for the better. So a couple, one other, other announcement here. There is a, a fishing event uh, happening July 22nd for the men. More info to come. So just keep, keep an eye out on the calendar, on the calendar and the um, bulletin. And we're going to continue to worship together this morning. Lord, you are doing great things here at our church, and we thank you for, for the work that you're doing here. Thank you for the great work that you are doing all over the world. All over this universe, Lord, you are working in mighty ways. So, Lord, we worship you this morning. I pray this in your name. Amen.
in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Good morning, everybody. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we do thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for this place where we can come and worship you and learn about you, Lord. Father, we, uh, we thank you that you've blessed us in this way. Lord, we would just uh, pray for this uh, country we live in. We pray for our leaders our government officials, our military, those that protect us, law enforcement, Lord. We thank you for them and their service. We thank you for all that they do. Lord, we pray that you would uh, give wisdom to our leaders, guide them and direct them. Lord, help them to make decisions that glorify you. Father, we, uh, we also would just uh, think about and pray for our missionary of the week this week, John Berninger. We thank you for him, Lord, as uh, he was just here recently on a trip with some students and uh, 
we thank you for that and for the, uh, the uh, work that they got done and the experience that was. But uh, now he's uh, getting ready to start a summer camp up there in Alaska. Lord, we pray for that. We pray that, uh, that the outcome would be great. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that young people would come to know you in a deeper way. Lord, that those that don't have a relationship would find you. Lord, we uh, also would just uh, lift before you the situation with the, uh, their speaker that was set up for high school who had to cancel at the last minute. We uh, pray for the situation in his family and uh, that you would work through that, but also pray for a replacement, Lord. We pray that uh, someone would be able to step up and take over that responsibility and that things would go well. Lord, we, uh, we also pray for us here and... Uh, for this week with VBS, Lord, we pray that, uh, that things would go great with VBS. We pray that, uh, that young people would be impacted with the gospel of Christ. We pray that, uh, that people would learn more about you and follow you, Lord. Father, we pray that, uh, that you would just bless our time here. Lord, we pray for, uh, for our, the service this morning. We pray for John as he brings the word. We pray that, uh, that those words that are spoken would impact our lives. Lord, that we would go out of this place changed and better for you. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, kids are dismissed, and uh, we can stand and greet one another.
All right. Let's come together and open up our Bibles now. Good morning. I want to start off today with a little riddle, okay? A little riddle. Let's see if you guys can, uh, can figure this out. What do all of these fellows have in common? I heard it. What was that, Mike? First name is Peter. That's right. We got Pistol, Pistol Pete. Maravich, we got Peter Parker, <laughs> we got uh, Peter Lorre, this, this one's for the uh, old movie buffs, and then who, who's that gentleman on the top right, you know that one? Pete Townsend from The Who, yeah, he's the guy who's always smashing his guitars. Uh, so the, the gentleman on the middle left there, what was his last name again? Dinklage, that's a great last name, I love that. And then you got Peter Pan, Peter Rabbit, Peter O'Toole, the classic uh, Lawrence of Arabia guy, and then Peter Frampton for all the rockers out there. Now, why would I show all these Peters? Why do you think? Because we are going to be in 2 Peter. That is right. Bright crowd. I love it. 2 Peter, uh, we are going to take a five-week journey through this epistle, this letter, penned by the Apostle Peter who was the leader of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. Obviously, 2 Peter is the sequel to 1 Peter, which we finished walking through as a church back in February. Feels like a long time ago now. Uh, but just to kind of refresh you, 2 Peter has the same general audience as 1 Peter had. They were primarily Gentile, but also some Jewish Christians. And this is the area in which they were living. Modern-day Turkey... Uh, back then, it was referred to as the Roman province of Asia Minor. So these are Christians, uh, a minority group, living there. Very difficult to be a Christian in, in those days. I, I mean, even today in that area, it's difficult to be a Christian. Uh, but they experience a lot of persecution for their faith. Now, Second Peter is the swan song of Peter, just as Second Timothy is, is the swan song of Paul. They're the last recorded words of one of Jesus' closest friends. Now, if that isn't enough, interesting enough, I don't know what is. Wouldn't you want to know what the last words of one of the most important disciples are? And that's exactly what we have here in 2 Peter. Uh, as you read it, they almost bear the marks of a last will and testament. You can sense that he knows the end is near. And he, he's writing shortly before he's going to suffer martyrdom, martyrdom at the hands of the evil Caesar Nero, Scholars estimate that took place sometime between 66 and 68 A.D. So shortly before that, Peter wrote this letter. Uh, according to reliable tradition, Peter was crucified upside down, saying that he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord was. And so he, he goes to prison, and then, then he's mar martyred in that gruesome way. Um, but going back to the letter, Peter's second letter builds on his first if you read one and then the other, you can see that they're, they're definitely connected. The purpose of his first letter was summarized right at the end of that letter. In fact, 1 Peter 5, verse 12, the second half, he says, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So that, that first letter is all about standing firm in God's grace, in the true gospel in spite of any persecution, any suffering you might have to endure, stand firm in it, in grace. Now the second letter is all about growing in this grace in which we stand. So that's, that's really the theme that we're going to keep on returning to in these next five weeks, growing in grace, growing in the grace in which we now stand. We have some responsibilities to fulfill now that we have received the true grace of God. It doesn't end 
when you're born again. No, it starts a, an entire life of growing and developing, just like a baby. You know, they're born, and we pray that they develop. The same thing is true when you're born again. The idea is that you mature and develop into the Christian that God wants you to be. The key verse is actually the very last verse of the whole letter. It's in the sign-off, and so a little bit of a spoiler alert. But check this out. 2 Peter 3.18, Peter says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Does that verse look familiar to anybody? Kids Club. Thank you, Luke. He works here. That doesn't count. All right. But, uh, yeah, this is actually the, the, the theme verse for the Kids Club. Every Wednesday, uh, you, you can see it on the garden outside, out front. It's on the sign there. And what a great verse it is. It's all about growing in your faith. Now, back to Peter. He, he's writing these letters, First and Second Peter, and he's doing so in obedience to the command of, of his Lord, his best friend, Jesus. Jesus told him in Luke 22 to strengthen his brothers. And in John 21, he told him to tend my lambs and shepherd my sheep. So Peter has a responsibility, and that's part of this responsibility, is, is writing these letters. And as he does so, he, he's pretty much doing two things. Number one, he's reminding his readers about fundamental true Christian doctrine. He's giving them the basics of faith and reminding them of these doctrines. And then secondly, he's warning his readers about aberrant teachings, about false teachings that have strayed from the truth. And he's warning them about coming apostasy. So he's reminding them, the tr reminding them of the truth and he's warning them about false teaching. First Peter dealt a lot with external pressures on the church. Fiery ordeals, persecution from their government, from their peers. Uh, Christians were thrown to lions. They were persecuted in horrible ways. Second Peter, instead of talking about external pressures, it's going to deal more with internal issues in the church. And it's, it's kind of like a big flashing neon warning sign. You know, warning, danger ahead. The biggest danger the church then faced was a decay of truth by permitting false teachers into their meetings. And as you know, false teaching eventually leads into bad living, to unrighteous, ungodly living. So the, the flip side is also true, right? If you get correct, good teaching, faithful, orthodox teaching, righteous and godly living should accompany that. That should be the natural outflow because if the truth doesn't change you, you must not really know it yet. I like how Kenneth Gangle, who's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, summarized the book of 2 Peter. He said, the purpose of 2 Peter is to call Christians to spiritual growth so that they can combat apostasy as they look forward to the Lord's return. And I, I have a feeling you guys are going to really enjoy this study as it gets into the third chapter because it talks about eschatology, things that are to come. You know, that, that's always something that we're interested in. You know, what, what are we to expect? How are these things going to wrap up on this planet? And Second Peter goes there. Peter's aim in this letter is to anchor the church on the word of God as the only solid defense against the coming storm of apostasy. And uh, his letter is very similar to Jude in this regard. You guys know Jude. It's a, a tiny book that as you're on your way to Revelation, you pass right before the end. It's the second to last book in the Bible. There are portions of 2 Peter that are actually almost identical to that little epistle of Jude. And uh, partially for that reason, it took a while for 2 Peter to be fully recognized as a canonical book. They're saying, we already got this material elsewhere. But the better way to view that is God is emphasizing this. You know, if something is said twice, God is saying, pay attention to this. And that's what's going on here. 2 Peter is definitely in the canon of scripture. Uh, early church councils, Laodicea, Carthage acknowledged it. Early church fathers, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, Jerome, you name it. Uh, it is part of scripture. And although it is relatively short, we would be lacking a lot if we didn't have this letter in our New Testaments. So in the weeks to come, we're going to learn much about the Bible's inspiration, about the end times. So you guys ready to jump in? 
Let's see what God has for us today in his word. First, let me pause and pray, and then we'll start the letter. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather to study and to show ourselves approved unto you, our God. Father, we want to be equipped for a Christian life, for Christian service. And so would you do that now, even as we sit here, as we meditate upon the word, would you help us to apply it to our lives, Lord, to be challenged, to be encouraged, that we would grow in our relationship with you. It doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian, we can all grow. And so, Father, my prayer is that our church would grow in maturity, each one of us as individuals as well, as we go through this study. Father, this is our goal, this is our aim, and we lay it at your feet. Do your work in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's start it off. Verse 1 of 2 Peter starts this way. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, my, my tendency is when, when I start a, a letter, I fly over the first part and I'm just concerned with the content, you know, the, the meat, the body of the letter. Uh, but that's a huge mistake as you read your Bible because there's a lot packed in to these intros and uh, we'll just kind of go through this verse first things first our author introduces himself notice how that's different than the way that we write letters typically we you know the person it's it's sent to we put their name first dear such and such and then we sign off at the end in ancient times they would put their name first right up front this is who is the author of this letter Uh, he says Simon Peter notice he goes by two names Simon was Peter's birth name his Hebrew name, and Peter is is a Greek name. It's the Greek translation of his Aramaic name, Cephas, which was his nickname. I know that's a lot to to kind of take in. Um, But that that second name, Peter, or Cephas, was a name that was not Peter's at birth, but Jesus was the one who actually gave it to him first. The first time he met him, in fact, it's described in John chapter 1, verse 42. It says, he brought him to Jesus Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now imagine that, someone walking up to you, hey, nice to meet you, here's your new name. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty much what's going on here. And this change of name was to reflect his solid character and role in the church. He, he's the, the rock, not Dwayne Johnson. This is the real rock. And you're like, what are you talking about? That's what that name Peter means. Petros in Greek, it means a massive, detached rock, a boulder. Some have nicknamed him Rocky. And uh, let me read you this, this key passage here in Matthew 16, where Jesus makes reference to Peter's name. I want to pick it up in verse 13. It says this, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, there's a lot of debate regarding that passage. You know, what is is the rock that's being referred to? Um, At the very least, we know that Peter's name means rock. There's actually two different Greek words used in Matthew 16. There's Petros and Petra. And he, uh, 80s Christian metalheads in here. Remember Petra? <laughs> that, that is actually a different word which implies that the church wasn't built on the person of Peter. No, it's built on Jesus Christ and, and the true gospel. That's what the, the gospel, I mean, what the church has been built on. Um, but regardless, Peter's name, Jesus does a word play there and he uses his name Rocky uh, to, to make this point. 
Now, there's a lot of Simons mentioned in the New Testament, but there's only one Peter. So when he introduces himself as Simon Peter, it leaves no doubt in the mind of his readers, this is the close disciple of the Lord. This is one of the original 12. This is, in fact, one of that inner circle of three. This is Peter, one of Jesus' best friends. Now, notice how he further identifies himself and also in what order. He says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. A bondservant and an apostle. Now, Peter held apostolic authority as one who knew Jesus, as one who was commissioned personally by the risen Christ. He was one who spoke with authority. He was a capital A apostle. And that's an important fact to remember as we, as we see Peter deal with false teachers later on in the letter. He's going to kind of pull his apostle card out. But ultimately, we need to notice that Peter realizes that at the end of the day, he's nothing but a willing slave of the Lord. And that's what he says first. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. A bondservant was a slave who is willingly a slave. See, Peter had learned humility in his life after a lot of mistakes and blunders. Peter's the same man we read about in the Gospels who denied Jesus three times. He was later restored by Jesus and recommissioned three times by Jesus. And then in the book of Acts, we read about how he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do more for the kingdom of God than he could have ever imagined. So he's a fascinating man. A bondservant, an apostle. Notice he doesn't ride a high horse. Uh, as he continues on, he says, To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter admits he was saved by grace through faith, just like all believers are. Our faith is a gift from God, and Peter received that gift. He received the gospel from Christ himself, while his readers, in turn, received it from Christ's disciples. Now, when he says ours here, it isn't entirely clear whether he's speaking of himself and the other apostles, or he's talking about the whole Christian community, or lastly, if he's talking about Jewish believers in particular, since his audience is primarily Gentile. But he's, he's lumping himself in this category. I'm one of those people who got saved too. Regardless, we know what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So notice it doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your gender. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's only one faith. And each of these apostles had that faith. And that's what he's talking about. It's the common denominator. Now, one other thing I want to point out in this verse before we kind of move on into the body of the letter. He says, To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, notice, notice the way I read that. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not our God, pause, and Savior, Jesus Christ. No, it's our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a, a, a truth about the second person of the Trinity, that he is both God and Savior. This is a deity claim verse for Jesus Christ. Forget those, those cultists who say that Jesus is not God. No, he is God. And uh, if you're a real nerd, you can get into the Greek grammar here and see that it is undoubtedly talking about the same subject. Both of those words describe the same subject, the same person. So this is just one more proof of the deity of Jesus Christ. He is our God and Savior. He's both. Now let's move on. Verse 2 and 3. Peter continues, says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, our Je and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. You guys are going to have to put on your thinking caps in this book. It's just, I'm just warning you, all right? I know there's a lot of big words strung together in long sentences. So you got to focus as you read this letter. And, you know, I, I actually kind of think this is funny because a lot of people paint Peter as 
you know, he's a roughneck fisherman, uneducated. I'm like, just read his letters. <laughs> this guy was intelligent, and uh, he had a lot of lofty concepts. God bless you, brother. Uh, so let's, let's look at what he says now. It says, grace and peace. Uh, this is a typical greeting. Grace was actually the Greek way of greeting, and peace was the Jewish way. You guys know shalom? Shalom, y'all, shalom, you know. Uh, peace, that's actually how they say hello and goodbye in, in Israel today. That's the way I sign off my letters and, and my typical sign in right there, grace and peace. Um, once again, there's significance to the order, I believe. Grace and then peace. It's kind of like the gospel in miniature. You can only enjoy peace with God after having received grace from God. You see that? You receive God's grace and now... You're at peace with God. You're reconciled. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, grace and peace. Hello, everybody. And then he explains, how are grace and peace to be felt and experienced? And he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the, what does it say? Knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Knowledge is a key word. In 2 Peter. Uh, it occurs 16 times in different forms. And in this form, it's actually emphatic. It's the word epignosis. You might, might hear the word gnosis and, and know that word, meaning knowledge. But epignosis, with that prefix, it, it is like a super knowledge. A full, intimate, precise knowledge. The goal here is to actually know God and Jesus Christ instead of just knowing about them. Any of you guys bilingual in here? Know any Romance languages? Spanish, English? How about French, English? Anybody? We got a couple. Uh, those languages have different words for, for no. So in Spanish, the word for no is what? Saber and conocer. She says saber is to know, but in terms of facts. You know, you, you know that it's uh, going to be lunchtime soon, something like that. Conocer is to have intimate knowledge, is to know a person or to know a place. It's more than just knowing about, it's to actually know. French is, is similar, savoir and connaître. Did you hear that little? Uh, sorry, that's, uh, yeah, anyways, moving on. Uh, so the goal here is to, to actually know, not just know about, is to have this super knowledge, this epignosis, and this is accomplished by the Holy Spirit taking the things of Christ and making them real to us. And this is our first point in our study, that we should strive to know God. We should strive to know God. This was of utmost importance to the apostles. Paul wrote it this way in, in Philippians 3 verse 10. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So knowing God, uh, there's one of my favorite verses, Daniel 11.32, it talks about how believers stand in trying times. It says, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. So we should strive to know God, both in our hearts and with our minds. And, you know, both of those are ways that we can grow, both in our heart knowledge of God and in our mind. Our, our general knowledge in the strictest sense. Uh, I think today there's far too many Christians who know too little about their faith. And this is why cults, false religions, have so much success. And, and this is just a rhetorical question for you to think about. Would you know how to defend true biblical Christianity if you were to have a conversation with a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or even a Roman Catholic for that matter? Would you know how to defend the gospel? And if you're kind of like, uh, well, that's okay. But strive to grow in your knowledge. That's what we should be doing. Uh, yesterday, my family, we went to Balboa Park down by the fountain there. You guys know that, that stretch that goes from one fountain to the other? Uh, my dad calls it the marketplace of ideas. And you have all these people set up. You have the Muslims. You have your friendly neighborhood atheists set up there. Uh, and then there's some, some believers there as well. 
But this is, this is the world in which we live. You know, you're engaging people all the time who have a different worldview than you. That's a little uh, plug for the worldview class that's going on. Uh, different worldview. And do you know enough about your Bible to defend true Christianity in a world that's going off the rails? Uh, that's the challenge. And uh, God has called us to true knowledge of him so that we can grow in him. You have to have that knowledge if you want to grow. And the, the good news is that he has supplied us with everything we need to do so. Pastor Warren Wearsby put it this way. He said, just as a normal baby is born with all the equipment he needs for life and only needs to grow, so the Christian has all that is needed and only needs to grow. And this is our next point. We should strive to know God and we should strive to grow in our faith. We're not left to our, our own devices with this. Uh, Peter then goes on to talk about all of the God-given resources for our growth. See, God has made every arrangement for our life in Christ. You know, what specifically has he given to us to this end? What resources do we have to truly know him and have a proper growing relationship with him? This is what Peter talks about next. And, and I want to give these to you now. What are the God-given resources for our growth? They're the divine power of God, first. And secondly, the precious and magnificent promises of God. So the power of God and the promises of God. These are the resources God has given to us for our growth in Christ. And I'm not just making this up. These come straight from the text. Uh, so let's look at the next verse and consider these resources now. Uh, I'll, I'll back it up reading verse 3 again. He says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Verse 4, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. One person said, you can never break God's promises by leaning on them. And I like that idea, that they're trustworthy. And it says uh, that God's promises to us are, are precious. That is, they're of great worth, and they're magnificent. Literally, they are the greatest. So where are these promises to be found? Where are they to be found? What do you think? Where can we find the promises of God? In the Bible, in God's word. God bless you again, Zach. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says this. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Bible is full of these precious and magnificent promises. So if we need to cling to these, if these are granted to us, uh, we, we should be people of the word so that we can grow. There's so many amazing promises for us to cling to in the Bible. I was just thinking of some of the ones that have meant the most to me. John 6, 37 comes to mind. It says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Matthew eleven twenty nine, another amazing promise. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Does that not sound good? An amazing promise from God. And then 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, this very verse, very verse itself, verse 4, contains an amazing promise in it. Notice that our justification in Christ has already assured our escape from the corruption of the world. Uh, the tenses here are significant. You know, it says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Having escaped, that's a past tense translation. And this is pretty cool because uh, this is just one of these truths about our salvation is that we experience it in three different tenses. Our justification, we have been saved. Who has been saved in here today? 
who's been justified. Amen. But that's not the end. There's also our sanctification, meaning we are being saved from sin's power in our lives. We're, we're being saved. And then glorification is salvation future tense. We shall be saved. And what's more, uh, Peter says that we are even partakers of the divine nature. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> that is a, an alarming phrase. What do you mean I'm a partaker of the divine nature? I'm just John, you know? <laughs> What do, what do you mean, a partaker of the divine? There's a lot of people out there who are trying to tap into some higher power, but they have a totally unbiblical idea about who God really is. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, New Age, spirituality, Eastern mysticism, the idea that you can become part of God or you're absorbed into the divine like a, like a drop in the ocean, you know? Is that the sense that we're partakers of the divine nature? No. No, it's not. <laughs> it is not. That is not what Peter's communicating here. The idea here is that we live a spirit-filled life. We're born again. We're transformed. We're a new creation. We're becoming more and more like our Savior because we now have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what this is talking about. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God's Holy Spirit, that is the third person of the Trinity, came to dwell in you. Pretty amazing. Thomas Constable of Dallas Theological uh, put it this way. He said, when God saved us by faith in his promise, he indwelt us, and we therefore possess the nature of God within us. God's Spirit in us manifests the likeness of God and Christ through us. He also gives us power that enables us to overcome or escape the temptations of lust that result in corruption. So when we put our faith in Jesus, we become spirit-filled children of God. And as such, we bear a family resemblance to our Father and to the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what this is referring to. So we've been given God's Holy Spirit, His divine power, We've been given God's holy book, his Bible, and these are the things that help us resist the corruption of sin and help us be able to know God and to grow in our Christian walk. But having these gifts, we need to do our part as well. So God has given us his Holy Spirit, his holy word, but it's not like you can just veg out now, you know? I'm just going to grow just by doing nothing. No, that's not how it works. We are to cooperate with God. It's his operation, but we're supposed to cooperate with it. Having these gifts, we have to do our part. We have a responsibility to cultivate our own Christian growth by exercising some virtues. And this is what Peter talks about next. Let's look at verse 5 through 7. Peter says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. So it's a pretty interesting way that he's presenting all of these things for us in this, this chain. But these are our virtues that if we want to grow in Christ, we need to add these things. We need to apply these things to our faith. Add diligence to your faith. Our spiritual growth calls for our strenuous involvement as we cooperate with God in the work he's doing. This helps explain another verse to me, this concept of cooperating with God. When Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, he said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see that? Work out your salvation for it's God who's at work in you. We're cooperating with him. It's, it's teamwork. I think a helpful analogy, it's like power steering in your car. right? The engine provides the power you need for steering, but the driver actually has to move the wheel. You see? So God has given us everything we need to grow in him. 
but we also need to take the reins and, and cooperate with him in what he's doing. If you don't work out your salvation, what is your faith but a, a dead faith? This is what is warned about it in books like James, chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So we have to put, into some, put some sweat into this. Uh, becoming godly is not automatic. It's not inevitable. It's a choice we continue to make. And it's important for us to realize that just because you've been a Christian for a long time or just because you're elderly up there in years, that does not make you mature in Christ. One does not follow the other. You have to continually grow in your faith, and you've you got to put some work into it. You can't be a lazy Christian and expect to be mature in the faith. Christian growth simply will not occur apart from our diligent participation in the process. So here, Peter gives us some crucial ingredients of what a godly life looks like. Here is what we're to be diligent to pursue. You can think of these, these virtues as things you're aiming for, like targets you're aiming for. And so let's break them down one by one. The first is moral excellence. Moral excellence, that is virtue. Purity and uprightness of character cultivated through obedience to God. There's also an, an aspect of this word that means courage. Heroic courage to stand for that which is right. Uh, this, the same word was used to describe the character of Jesus back in verse 3. By his own glory and excellence is said. So we're to pursue excellence and once more we're to pursue knowledge. And this is not epignosis, this is that word gnosis. The simple word for knowledge meaning acquired information or content. It's not rocket science, right? To grow, you need to know. To know all that God has revealed in his word. What we refer to as the whole counsel of God. How can you be a mature Christian if you're not in the word, if you don't know what the word says? Remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission. This is the part not many people focus on in that famous uh, charge of the Lord. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus told his disciples, he said, go therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. See, that's a part of the Great Commission too. Sharing everything that Jesus taught and teaching people to obey. And Jesus promised, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we're to grow in our base knowledge as well. This is why you guys got to come at 9 o'clock for those small groups. This is why Wednesday night you got to be here. All right? I'm not embarrassed to, to say that. How are you, you going to grow in your faith if you're not investing in, in knowing more about the Lord? Now, the next virtue here is self-control, which uh, literally in the original language is to hold oneself in. <laughs> So self-control is something that we should shoot for, a mastery of ourselves over our, our personal desires and passions, disciplined, moderation, temperance in every area of life. You know, it's not just talking about food or, or sex. It's every, every aspect of your life you can exhibit self-control. Are you biting your tongue, right? Things like that. The next virtue, perseverance. This is a word it, which in, in Greek literally means to remain under something, such as a heavy load. The idea is you, you're carrying it without collapse. It's endurance in holiness when we're tempted to give in or give up. You know, it's to keep on keeping on in the faith. So we're to pursue perseverance. And then godliness is the next one on the list. Simply put, this is behavior that reflects the character of God. It's uh, kind of out of vogue now, but you guys remember that little, that little phrase, WWJD? What would Jesus do? People had little bracelets and, you know, little bumper stickers on their car. I haven't seen one of those in a long time, but it's a great thought, right? What would Jesus do? What would God in flesh do? Essentially, you're asking, what is God's nature and character like? And how would that work itself out in whatever situation I'm in? Simply put, godliness is behavior that reflects the character of God. 
And then the next one on the list is brotherly kindness. You guys know this Greek word, Philadelphia. All right? Ironically, the murder capital of the United States of America. Uh, <laughs> um, but what is brotherly kindness? Brotherly kindness, it's thoughtful consideration of fellow believers. So how are, you, how are you treating your fellow Christians? And then last, but certainly not least, is love. Notice that's the way Peter ends this list. Love. This is that word agape, the highest form of love. Some of your translations might say charity. This is that sacrificial, self-giving love of God that seeks the welfare of another above one's own welfare. This is a love that is devoted to the well-being of others. This is gospel love. To love the sinner as God loves him. This is the word we see in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that what? That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is a love that gives. So notice one thing about this list before we move on. It started with faith. And it ends with love. Faith is the root, and love is the fruit. It's, it's the outward progression of, of inner qualities. These progressively get further. You know, they, they start inside, and as you look at this list, there are things that eventually manifest themselves to, to others. It's like Peter's version of Paul's famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. We see that, that Christian faith is the root from which all these virtues grow and Christian love is the the crowning virtue to which all the others contribute and I think this is really a good checklist if you're a checklist kind of person and you're thinking how am I doing how am I doing with God am, am I growing in my faith this is a list you can look at and say how have I been doing in terms of self-control how have I been doing in terms of perseverance am I able to to bear up under these burdens of life how am I doing in godliness? How am I doing in brotherly kindness? How am I doing in self-giving love? This is a good checklist to return to from time to time in order to evaluate whether you're being all that God wants you to be, whether you're growing in your faith. Now let's press on, verse 8 and 9. Peter says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Question for you. Do you want to be useful for God? Do you want to live a productive life? I hope so. And, and this is our next truth. That if you are faithful, you will be fruitful. One follows from the other. And, and Peter's saying, this is God's will for you, to bear fruit in your life. And Peter gives a powerful word picture here of the opposite of that. The opposite of a growing Christian is a stagnant Christian. And the word here, it says, you know, they're short-sighted. It's literally, they're myopic. They're myopic. They're short-sighted. They, they only see what's in front of their face. They're living for the present. They have little regard for the future. Their vision is severely limited to the here and now. And there's a lot of believers living this way. They're, they're just concerned about the day-to-day -day humdrum. You know, they're not worried about investing in the kingdom. And, and this is why there's a lot of people, you can't even tell if they're a believer or not. You know, he's like, believer, non-believer, I can't see the difference. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to bear fruit. I, I think this, this tragic stagnancy happens because a lot of Christians have forgotten just how much God has done for us. And that, notice that key part of what Peter says. It says in verse 9 again, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. How could we forget all that God has done for us? All that God wants to do in us, all that God wants to do through us. We have spiritual amnesia, right? But no, we were saved for a purpose, to glorify God with our lives. So we can't take his grace for granted. Let's rather let his grace fuel us to live for him. I've been forgiven much, so now I need to live for the one who forgave me. That's the idea. 
At this point of the passage, I, I do want to make clear once again, what is the gospel truth? That we are saved by grace through faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. We're not saved by works. All right, I don't want you to leave here thinking, yeah, I'm saved by works. No, that's not it. No, we're not saved by works, but we are saved for good works. We're saved so that we could live a fruitful life. The Bible's crystal clear on this. Uh, we can know that we're saved. First John chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So you can know today that you are saved. You can know if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know, the real deal. If you put your faith in him, then you, you know you're saved. But even so, while the eternal security of the believer is an objective fact, sometimes your personal assurance of salvation can seem to waver. Maybe you've experienced that before. Times in your life where you're struggling with the, with the pernicious sin. You're thinking, am, am I really saved? Why am I not having victory over this? And if you look at your life and, and you know, looking at this checklist and you aren't really seeing these Christian qualities, you might start to wonder, right? Where do I stand? Have I really believed if my life bears no evidence? And you know, I don't want to take away the sting from that question. A lot of people try to do that, but that's a legit question. Have I really believed if my life bears no evidence? Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? We're saved by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone who did all the work on the cross for us. But fruit in our lives, it doesn't give us eternal security, but it assures our hearts that we are his. I hope that makes sense. The, the truth is our assurance of salvation is always based on the perfect and complete salvation God has provided for us through Jesus. And, you know, how would you answer this question? Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus as your savior? How would you answer that? Yes? Well, then rest assured, you're saved. But nevertheless, it's a true encouragement when you can actually see the evidence in your life. So once more, Peter calls his readers to be diligent about their growth in Christ. So, so you're seeing, I can tell by the silence in the room that, you know, this is a weighty matter. Right? We, we need to be serious about our growth in Christ. It's not a flippant thing. This is God's will for us. This is why we're alive. Now let's look at verse 10 and 11 to wrap it up today. Therefore, brethren, so a summary statement, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. We also want to know the Lord. We want to grow in him because we have a heavenly reward to look forward to. I love this. Peter, in this letter, he's so focused on the future goal. He's focused on, on heaven. And we, as faithful disciples of Jesus, can anticipate with joy a, a warm welcome from our Lord into his kingdom. What a beautiful picture, right? You made it. You made it. And there's going to be eternal rewards given for faithful, fruitful believers. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 and following. It says, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So who would you rather be like? You know, when all is said and done, would you rather be that guy who is like the person who loses everything, barely escaping from a burning house with your life? Or would you rather be like a victorious athlete, triumphantly entering into your home stadium to receive a prize? 
That's, that's the picture we're given in the scripture. How are you living your life? Are you just barely escaping the fire? Or are you going to get a hero's welcome because you've been living the Christian life? You've been growing in your faith. Let's, let's live in light of our eternal home. To conclude, Dr. Paul Cedar of the Mission America Coalition, he said this, he said, the Christian life is not a list of propositions or a tight theological system. It's a vital relationship to a resurrected Lord. And this is the balance here. We labor together with God in our sanctification because it's a real relationship. We're working with God. We're cooperating with God because we're related to him. The Christian life is a combo of toil and trust. We believe and we obey. God has saved us by his grace, and now he wants us all to grow in grace. And he's promised so many things. He's given us the resources we need to succeed. Just to review, his power in us, we got the Holy Spirit, and his promises to us. We have his word. And we can have success in life and ministry. He gave us everything we need. All we need to do is get serious about our growth. Let's look at that checklist. Let's see where we're measuring up. And let's press on with God's help to live that Christian life and to grow. So now, instead of being free from our responsibility to grow as Christians, our responsibility is actually increased as we read these things. And I, I want to wrap it up with this analogy here. A chairlift. At a ski resort. Uh, Karen and I were at the Del Mar Fair a few weeks ago, and they have one of these things going over the whole fair. Man, people talk about exhibiting faith. Del Mar Fair, faith is uh, abundant over there <laughs> in these uh, temporary structures that people set up. But the, these chairlifts, when you think about it, you know, if you go skiing, go snowboarding, you, you get on this chairlift, and you're, you're trusting it, and the cable is going to pull you all the way up the mountain. But what do you got to do? You got to make sure you're holding on. Right? It's not doing any good if you let go. So let's continue to cling to the Lord. Be found growing in him until he returns or calls us home. He's going to take us all the way. But we got to stay close to him. Amen? All right. Let's pray and conclude our time with worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter. We thank you for the challenge to grow, to keep growing. But wherever we are in our relationship with you, we can certainly grow closer to you. We can always learn more about you. You're an infinite God. And your word has so many precious promises, Lord. Help us to be in it. Help us to utilize the power of your spirit in our life as well. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, oh God. And so we want to be reliant upon you for our growth as we cooperate with you in our growth. Father, I pray for our church that as we go forth today, we would be challenged to pursue these godly virtues that Peter's been talking about. And Father, for the one who has not yet started this relationship with you, you can't grow unless you know. And by know, I mean to know you personally. Father, if there's somebody in here today who needs to know you, they can do that now. This is eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, the one whom you've sent. You sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and rise on the third day, paying for sins once and for all and conquering sin and death in his resurrection. And you promised that all who call upon his name will be saved. Father, would that be someone listening to this today, that they would say, Dear Father, I acknowledge I've sinned, I repent for my sin, and I turn and put my trust in the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I call him my Lord. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's respond to our awesome God and worship today as we close. Have thine own way.
thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord. Wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me to take our hearts and you'd form it after your will, Lord. We need to grow, Lord. On our own, we're, we're a mess. <laughs> we need you to, to take the reins in our life. Help us to trust you and lean on you and walk in faith. Live out the way you want us to live and grow in our faith. That's what you call us to do, Lord. Pray as we go from here today that you would just be 
be fueling us to do that. You'd be honored. Pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Feel free to stick around and help out with uh, VBS if you like. And uh, <laughs> Zach's saying, now, he's making me make it a demand. It's not a demand, but we'd love for you to be here and help out with that. So have a good one.